the book of Romans, chapter 13. Verses 8 through 14. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Do this, knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to waken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Those are really strong words all the way through. But notice the statement that reflects on the society. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Then notice, he says, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. You could read those verses and you could apply them easily to the United States of America, to Western culture, to be sure. And there, for that reason, we need to keep in mind who we are. There are some age groups in our country that basically say we're evangelical, we believe in the Bible, but this is the part of the Bible that we don't really believe in, and this is how we are putting together our ethics and our morality, and we will live by these standards. And they are a far cry from the standards that this passage lays out. And so we need to keep in mind that we need to know who we are. Notice that for communion purposes, we're called to examine ourselves. Even the secular thinkers as far back as Plato and Socrates, Aristotle, all of them had this to say, know yourself. And remember back in the day when all of a sudden we had the existentialists running about? It was so much fun, I miss those days. You'd have some existentialists come up and say, oh, I'm just looking for myself, I can't find myself. And so finally I developed a question, and it worked pretty well. The topic actually changed. You'd say, well, what are you going to do if you find yourself and you don't like it? If you had a hard time finding, is it going to be easy to get rid of? And they'd give me a blank look, and usually the conversation would go on to something else. Not as much fun for me, but maybe a little more uh, acceptable to them, whatever. But notice that self-examination is important. It's important that we know who we are and why we do and live as we do. So let's keep in mind really who we are. And there are two things, at least in these few verses, that we are keepers of the law and as keepers we exercise love's protective power. Notice that in the 10th verse we read, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love fulfills law's demands. And notice here, it's negatively oriented. Sometimes we find that it might be difficult to do something good for someone, but it always seems like it's easy enough to do some harm to somebody. Oftentimes I'd picture a ride home after teaching a course, and you could say, you know, you can go driving by here, and all of a sudden you can pull up next to a car, shoot his tire out, and go on your way. And it wouldn't be much of a problem except, oh, the joy that the malice gives to you but it takes perhaps a little more effort to see a person with a flat tire and you pull over to help that individual out. Sometimes the doing of good deeds basically calls for effort. But yet, notice there is a negative aspect to it, and I don't mean negative in the sense of the word that there's something wrong. It means that there's something that will not be done because it's the right thing not to do. 
Love does no wrong to a neighbor. I may not be able to do something affirmative for my neighbor, but there certainly is something that I can do uh, to harm him, and therefore to understand that true love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love prohibits harm. So we are not in a neutral zone. We are in a zone where there are always opportunities, but are these opportunities moral and ethical for us as sons and daughters of the living God? So love is on the alert to keep from doing harm. And love will negate harm as an option. We hear people all the time say, I have freedom of choice. I am free to choose right or wrong. We are not free to choose right or wrong. We are free to choose the right and the good and the better over the good and the best over the good and the better. That is what our responsibility is for Christians. For somebody who is not a believer, they may say, I have the free will to choose right or wrong. We may be capable of doing it, but we do not have moral or ethical permission to do so. And this is the difference between the ethics of love and the ethics of autonomy. Now then, notice that the one who loves lives lawfully. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. One time a person came up to me after making some, me making some reference to this passage or a passage like it, and he says, we are no under law, we are no longer under law, we are under grace, we're free. And I said, is that the case? And he said, yes. I said, so am I free to pull out a gun and murder you? He says, no, you're not free to pull out a gun. Then I said, I guess we're somewhat under the law, are we not? There's a law that says I shall not murder you, and you believe in that very much, particularly if you're looking down the end of the barrel that I'm holding. And our discussion changed shortly after that. But we need to be thoughtful as to what it means. And what it means is that we are committed to doing that which is right and to keep from doing that which is wrong. So the one who loves lives lawfully. We do live under the law, but it's uh, for different terms. The demands of the law have been satisfied and met in Jesus Christ. And the, the terms of the law that would be held against us has been removed because of Jesus Christ, who is our righteousness. Now we have the freedom to live according to the law as it reflects on the righteousness and the goodness of God, our Creator and our Savior. Therefore, the one who loves, lives lawfully. And as keepers, we exercise love's protective power. For notice that in verse 9 we read, For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Notice we respect our neighbor's rights, because what we are looking at here is an understanding that human beings have rights. It's not just somebody who sits in an ivory tower on a university campus. We find it in, in our literature that we live by. For notice there is a right that, standing, that stands behind this. You shall not commit adultery. Why? Because there is the right to exclusive relationships. A man and a woman have the right to enter into a relationship that should be honored and respected by all others. And for those who crave whatever is the person that they're looking at, this is wrong. This is definitely wrong. And to commit adultery violates the right of exclusive relationships to be held sacred. The same is true with you shall not murder. There is indeed the right to life. And the right to life not only goes to those who are in the womb, but it goes to every person, that I do not have the right to shoot you dead. You do not have the right to shoot me dead or to do anything else along those lines. This is the right that I have to life, and you should respect that right to life. And this is the right to life that you have, and I should respect it. And so it is that there is the right to relationship, there is the right to life, and notice there is the right to property as well. You shall not steal. There is an understanding 
that I can own certain things, that they are mine, and you have the responsibility to recognize that it is my possession. Similarly, as your neighbor, that I need to recognize that there are some things that you rightfully own. There are all things, we'll say, that you rightfully own, and I must respect the fact that they belong to you. So we have these rights that stand behind these prohibitions, that those who are people of love will not commit adultery, they will not murder, they will not steal, and if they really don't want to do that, they will not covet or crave. Because the idea simply is there that our neighbor has the right of expectation. The neighbor expects that we control our tendency to covet and to crave. The neighbor expects to control the covetousness. And to control the covetousness is the tendency to keep from violating the rights of others. If I take care of my own self, your rights are honored. And when you take care of yourself, my rights are honored. Being neighbors as well, we have the mutual right. Whatever right you have, I have it as well. And therefore, there is a responsibility that rests on me. And it is a negative responsibility in that this shall not be done. These rights shall not be violated. And this is a part of the Christian walk. And what we understand, at least in what we observe sometimes in our generation, is that everybody likes the happy, good feelings, but nobody necessarily likes to hear, thou shalt not do. It infringes upon the freedom of will. The freedom of will is always limited by any number of things, but most of all, it is limited by love. And so we as the people of God should be treated with equality and treat others with equality as well. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If we have a person who's in his or her right mind, there is a proper self-respect, and that proper respect looks to do what it can to maximize the most benefit in life. And that particular inclination should also be applied to other people. And there is what binds us together, is that the respect that we have. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And notice that we ought to be debt free, but at the same time, we ought to be in debt. For notice the eighth verse of chapter 13. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. We always seek God's will. We always seek to do that which is right. But sometimes we're always seeking that which is right, which is held by his will and by his providential care. And we should take tremendous amount of time to pay attention to what is revealed to us in God's word by which we should live. And notice that we ought to be debt free. Owe nothing to anyone. Now, the idea of debt here doesn't mean that you can't take out a credit card. What it means is that on the day when the bill is due, the bill is paid. A bill that goes unpaid is basically considered to be a debt in this particular setting. So there ought to be people who are debt-free, and that's you and me. But at the same time, we, are, we ought to be debtors as well. Notice, owe nothing to anyone except for this one thing, to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Often is the time we want to know what God's will is for our lives and specific with the calendar, with the schedule and this like. But notice that we need to pay good attention to what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And it means this is one who loves his neighbor and in doing so is one who keeps the law of love. So we ought to be debtors. At the same time, we are not to be debtors. So let's pay attention to what area and category it is that we are supposed to be in debt. And let us be sure that we recognize that we are debtors, even as the Lord has called us to be. This raises a number of questions as to what our life should be about. Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Love calls for compliance. 
And Jesus put it, put it in such a way when he says, if you love me, he's raising the question, I think only for soul searching, if you love me. And the question is, do you love me? And if you do, then you will keep my commandments. And these things, it's, to me, it's sometimes kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing. There are things in the Bible that are hard to understand, and we wrestle and pray over it, and we have classes to go to and everything, and then there are things that are easy to understand. And sometimes the things that are easy to understand are the things that we wish that would be hard to understand, then we would have an excuse. But notice that when it comes to living the life of love, it's pretty clear, it's pretty simple. You don't need to go through a bunch of philosophical or metaphysical ideas to come up with an understanding of this. Quite simple, if you love me. Do you love me? Then keep my commandments. Do you love me? Then get on with it. If you love me, this is how you will know that you do. If you do love me, you will keep my commandments. Love calls for compliance. And once again, when we hear people talk about the freedom of choice, they have a misunderstanding when it comes to our relationship with Christ. If we do have the freedom of choice, then indeed it is to choose the good over the bad and to choose the right over the wrong. And this is what compliance is. Compliance has acceptance as well. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Notice that compliance has acceptance. He who has my commandments, that's one thing. But it's another thing to have them and to keep them. The one who has and the one who keeps is the one who loves me. And Jesus made it quite clear. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you don't love me, you won't. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. Notice that the way that we are loved by God the Father is related to whether or not we love Jesus Christ. And our love for Jesus Christ is shown by our willingness to comply with the commandments of love. And notice, I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Often is the time we want to be closer to Christ, and so we should. Everybody with a healthy relationship with the Lord wants to what? Grow in their understanding of the faith. Grow in the strength of their faith. And this is what we see here, is it not? He loves, he who has my commandments, who is in ownership of them and understands them and keeps them. This is the one who loves me. Anybody can say, I love the Lord. The one who takes the time to know the commandments of the Lord and to live by them. This is the one who truly loves the Lord. And he who loves the Lord will be loved by my Father. We should be able to walk up to one another and say, does the, does the Heavenly Father love you? And we should be able to say back, we know that the Heavenly Father loves us because we love his Son. And I will love him, and I will disclose myself to him. If we want to be closer to the Lord, let us be sure that we have his commandments in full possession, and we are willing to live by them. Love calls for compliance. Compliance has acceptance, and acceptance speaks of blessing. In James chapter 1, verse 25, we read, But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Notice it speaks of blessing. It speaks of a sense of completion in our lives. It speaks of a completion that brings satisfaction and fulfillment to our lives. And this is the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty. Notice sometimes we automatically respond when we hear that's the law and we think, notice here, the law somehow cuts us up short, binds us. But in this instance, this is the law of liberty. When one follows these principles and these commands, this is the one that gives to us the full freedom 
to live our lives as God intends us to live them. And by not and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man will be blessed in what he does. This is the thing. We spend much time memorizing and understanding the word of God intellectually and mentally. And so we should. But notice we should not stop there because what we see is this is the one he abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. And not only just a doer, but an effective one. This is one thing to be out there doing the work. It's another thing to be effective at it. But the one who knows the word of God, the commandments of liberty, and lives by them, is the one who is blessed in what he does. Knowing that we will be judged by the law of love, and for the sake of the blessing, let's be sure that we do the following. One, love the Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Is there one aspect of our lives that is left out and could be exempted from the law of love? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, without exception, with all your soul, without exception, with all your mind, with all your strength, that ye, we love the Lord. Knowing that we will be judged by the law of love, let's be sure that we love the Lord, because this is what the law of love entails. And not only do we love the Lord, but we love one another as well. Romans 13, 8, once again. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Owe nothing to anyone except love. And notice the neighbor. And when we have one another, the term neighbor, for he who loves his neighbor, speaks of another kind. And it speaks of there may be a difference between the one who loves and the one who is being loved, but that difference should not be a cause for division. For he who loves his neighbor has loved the law and will continue to love the law as well. Love the Lord. Love one another. Love your enemy. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And it is, the prayer is not always to bring down a curse on their head. I don't think that's the idea here, do you? You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor. Notice that you have heard that it was said, as though this is something that is strange and far away, and at the same time hate your enemy. But Jesus Christ forces himself into the situation. But whoever said that needs to pay attention now to me. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. We've all heard the statement, I, <clears throat> I may have to love you, but I don't have to like you. And I suppose there might be something to consider there, but the idea simply is, how can you really love somebody and not have some kind of liking, quote, unquote, to carry on with the relationship with that person. They are our enemies, and they may be hard to like, but they are not impossible to love. And it seems to me that somewhere, love will at least try to bring online the matter of liking as well. And you pray for your enemies and those who persecute you, that God may do his will and his work in the life of the prayer warrior and in the life of the object of prayer. Notice, the objects of love, the Lord, one another, your enemy, and all of that plays out in a practical application day by day. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. Notice we don't always have opportunity, but when we have the opportunity, we seize it and we take advantage of it. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good. Notice to all people, not just to those who are like us, but we must keep our brothers and sisters in mind. Do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household 
of faith. Sometimes the hardest people to get along with is our brothers and sisters in the faith. But all that means is we have to try a little bit harder. There's no exemption that I know of in God's word that lets us out of this obligation. So then, while the opportunity is there, we may not always have opportunity, but we are to seize the opportunity that we do have. And this opportunity should be seen in light of all people, not just those who are like us, but those who are unlike us. And especially though, to those who are of the household of faith. Don't forget the brothers and the sisters. Sometimes we can get so taken in by all of the people around us that need spiritual help, and it's true, but don't forget the brothers and the sisters. We start with the Lord, and we end with the Lord, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. This is a part of the responsibility that we need to do for ourselves, and only we can do it ourselves. We can have help and encouragement, but in the end, the responsibility rests upon us to make sure that we have put on the Lord Jesus Christ and we have made no provision for the flesh. And in the kind of society we live in, anybody who puts on Jesus Christ, on some occasions, they don't even have to say a word, and Jesus Christ will be seen showing through the lives of the brothers and the sisters. So let's not forget the law of love because this is the way to life everlasting and life abundant. And we find that in Christ and in Christ alone. Let's pray. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we thank you for the principles that you've given to us, the principles that you endorse, the principles that you command, the principles that were intended to reflect your glory in our lives, the principles that were intended to give to us blessing and fulfillment. May we be men and women who love you, who love your word, who love your people, who love our enemies. And we will thank you for the grace and the wisdom and the strength to do all of these things. In Christ's name we pray, amen.